so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. Then you can check out our latest blog post, you can look at our latest podcast, or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Now, as you go through this message, I pray that God works life change into your life and welcome to Church on the Rock. Romans chapter 12, verse 9, it says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Boy, could I stay there and preach a while? Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. Take delight in honoring one another. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Listen to this, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Wow. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. I could preach a series on that. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way everyone can see you're honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Wow. That is such a powerful passage. I'm really gonna focus on just one little verse, verse 18 this morning, probably the shortest one in all this. It says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Now that may sound so short and so simple, but there is so much in that little phrase. The King James says, if it be possible, as much as lies in you, or as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. The title of my message this morning is The Long Walk Around. The long walk around, and we're gonna be dealing with the question, how do you handle conflict? How do you handle conflict? The question is not, will you handle conflict? I promise you, you will. You will. But how do you handle it? Now, in order to, to, to do this justice, first I had to define conflict. So I grabbed my phone, I Googled in definition of conflict, and here's what popped up. A serious disagreement or argument, typically a protracted one. In other words, it's not a one-time thing. It goes on and on and on. You're arguing about the same thing for days and weeks and months and years. It's a protracted one. The second definition said to be incompatible or at variance to clash, to clash. Anybody ever clash with anyone? It don't matter what topic it is. You just clash. You just, you just clash with them. Here are some of the synonyms of Conflict, dispute, quarrel, squabble, disagreement, dissension. So you get the idea. Now, the question before us is how do you handle conflict? Not will you have conflict, you will. You ever been married? You ever have kids? You ever had teenage kids? You ever had a mother in law? Brother-in-law, sister-in-law, brother, sister, best friend, worst enemy. Yeah, we all experience conflict. Some people experience it more than others. Some people seem to be drawn to conflict. Some people seem to enjoy conflict. Other people will avoid conflict at all costs. Some conflict can be healthy can be healthy and can produce great results. Today, about 
Millions will gather around the television to watch a conflict between the New England Patriots and the Denver Broncos, the Super Bowl. Conflict of all conflicts. Hopefully that'll be good sportsmanship, good game. Other conflicts are not so healthy. They're destructive. They can destroy relationships. They destroy friendships. They destroy uh, families. They destroy churches. They destroy businesses. Conflict. They even destroy entire nations. You remember a little skirmish that started back April 12th, 1861? Lasted almost four years to May 9th, 1865. We call it the Civil War. It tore this nation apart. It ripped us apart, the very fabric of our nation. I'm afraid today we find ourselves in a different type of civil war, one that once again puts our nation at odds with itself uh, and threatens to tear this nation apart again. We've become so polarized, black and white, Democrat and Republican, the haves and the have-nots, and we've so polarized ourselves to be on one side or the other. We're right, you're wrong. All of you are like this. All, all of them are like this. How many remember reading and studying about World War II in, in history? Four of you, great. A uh, bunch of history majors here. We still have some World War II vets around um, that we're, we're, we're losing a lot. Uh, we had over 16 million uh, people enlisted in America for World War II. We have less than 698,000 World War II vets left now. We're losing our vets very quickly. World War II wasn't like other wars, though. The Civil War, our nation fought each other, tore each other apart. Remember, the Vietnam conflict, was, was, it was filled with conflict. Half the nation's off fighting for a cause. The other half's at home protesting the war, you know, and, and saying we shouldn't even be there, and there's this big tear in our nation. And much the same as the Gulf War and Desert Storm and every war and conflict since then, the big conflict, the big debate is should we even be there? But World War II was different. World War II, the entire country rallied around each other. There was something that happened in that. People made great sacrifices, personal sacrifices. Women left their homes and went into the workplace so the men could go and fight. That's when Rosie the Riveter was born. Remember? Rosie the Riveter, it showed this woman who was out welding and working in the workplace so the men could go off and fight. And there was, you know, we stormed the beach at Normandy and still today, what do we call this generation? Say it again. The greatest generation. That's what they're known as. This was the greatest generation. Why? Because there was the absence of conflict within. We had conflict with the enemies, with the other nation, but, but this nation, there was such patriotism. They come together for a common cause. Now, what does all this have to do with us? Well, if we're to get honest, most of our conflict is not as much about an issue as it is about stubbornness and pride. Am I right? If we get honest, we have a need to be right. And that need to be right breeds things like bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, all of these things, and, and lifelong friends part ways over some insignificant issue because neither are willing to take that first step and try to understand why that other person may be angry or hurt and say, I'm sorry, I had no idea that I hurt you like that. Please forgive me. But the words too often never get spoken. Someone told me just before service this morning, they said that, that you know, Part of my family's ultra liberal, part of them's very conservative. And my uncle came and, and they got into this conflict and it made my mother cry. And that's not the end of the story. The worst part, he said, and the uncle was a pastor. I thought, yeah, that's the worst ones. Anyway, many, so many times, these words never get spoken. Why? Because of one of the seven things that God says, I hate. One of them is a proud heart. God says, I hate that stuff. I hate that stuff. I don't care if you think you're right. You're wrong just because of your attitude. 
The scripture says if you come to the altar and you remember that your brother has ought against you, he has some, not that you're mad at them, but if you remember they're mad at you, get up from the altar, go and try to make peace with that person and then come back to the altar. But you do whatever you can, whatever is possible, do what you can do to live at peace with all men. See, you may win the battle, but you're losing the war. You may win the argument, but at what price? A friendship? A relationship? Your marriage? Your children? Your church? Your job? At what price are you paying for the privilege of being right? The Greek word for sin, if you look it up in the Greek, I'm not a big Greek scholar and Hebrew scholar, but I've looked this word up, and the Greek word for sin is hamartia. It simply means to miss the mark. That's what sin in the English language means. It means to miss the mark, to miss the mark. And that makes a little more sense when you understand the Apostle Paul saying that this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind me and reaching forth to those things which lie ahead, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There is a mark there, and I do not want to miss the mark. I do not, because when I miss the mark, I sin. When I miss the mark, and our problem is we don't just miss the mark, we're, we're shooting at the wrong target. We're trying to be right. Paul said, I'm aiming for the mark. I'm reaching for the mark. I don't want to, I don't want to just win the battle only to lose the war. I don't want to win the argument but lose the relationship. Jesus never said I had to always be right. He said I had to love other people like he loved me. That's what he told me to do is to love other people, not to always be the final authority on every situation. And so I've dedicated and, and, and uh, devoted what's left of the rest of my life at trying, church, to hit that mark, trying to hit that mark, to love people like Christ loves me. Now think about this. Paul wrote this in our text. Do all that you can do to live in peace with everyone. Now, we may be inclined to say, yeah, that's easy for you to say. You're the Apostle Paul, all right? What do you know about conflict? And that's laughable. Because can I tell you, Paul knew more about conflict than it, most anybody else that I know of? Paul, if you remember, when his name was Saul, he killed Christians just for being Christians. He was the original ISIS. He was rooting out the Christian segment by genocide and killing them just because they were Christ followers. And when he saw the light, literally saw the light, and he was converted, now he's gone from being the biggest adversary of the church to the biggest advocate. That sounds great, but can you imagine? Let's look at it from the church side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I hear you, Paul, talking about your love and your grace and mercy. Where was that when you were stoning my father? You're going to talk to me about love when you killed my mother? You think there's not some room for some conflict there? I remember you. Don't stand up and tell me about how God, God, this, God, that. You were there. You took part. And then his old buddies, they look at him and they say, you traitor, you coward, you turncoat. How dare you abandon us as we're rooting out this sect of Christ followers and Christians. And now you've not only stopped doing it, you've become one of them. You've become their chief spokesman. So he's getting conflict. Paul knew something about serious conflict. It's no wonder he would say this one thing I do, forgetting those that are behind me, forgetting the things I've done in the past and looking forward to the things that lie ahead. I'm pressing toward a mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna miss the mark. I don't always have to be right. I don't have to win the argument. I just wanna keep my eyes on the mark and the prize that's set before me. Paul would say, I'm sorry for my past. I can't change what I did. I can only put it behind me and try to forget it and reach toward the mark that's been set before me. How many of you play golf? Boy, I have failed in my duties as a pastor. How many of you watch golf? Few more. I never figured out how people watch golf that don't play golf. Because even for golfers, it's kind of boring. For non-golfers, I don't know. You're just trying to get something to put you to sleep. Let me tell you something about golfers. I mean, for the rest of you, I can't help you. You're just going to get your life right. 
But if you've ever watched golfers, I mean real golfers, not golfers like me, when they get ready to make a putt, that's a putter, they made it to the green, and now they've just got to get the ball from wherever it lies to the hole that these flags usually sit in the little hole. Now me, my ball is here, flag's there. I look at it, walk up, say a little prayer. Occasionally make one, miss more than I make. That's how I golf. But if you watch good golfers, I'm talking about the guys that make money doing this. They don't do that. Their ball's here. And they walk and they look at it. Chat with their caddy a little bit. They'll reach down and pick up some grass and throw it up in the air, see if there's any wind that could possibly affect the trajectory of this thing. And they'll squat down and they'll take their putter and they'll, they'll line up that ball with the hole, kind of makes an imaginary line from the ball to the hole. So they see exactly what line. They'll look at what, what golfers call the grain. It means the grass. It, grass doesn't always grow straight. Sometimes grass sort of bends to the left or it sort of bends to the right. And they'll look at the grain because if it bends to the left, the ball's automatically just going to drift a little bit with the grain. So they'll, so they'll see which way the grass is growing. And then good golfers do something else. They take great time and they'll walk a long way around, not getting too close because golfers have spikes on their shoes. So if they walk right here, well, that's gonna kind of put holes and possibly dirt and grass in the way of their ball and it's gonna hit the ball, it's gonna hit that and jump around. So they walk all the way around to the other side and then they start the process all over. They get back down and they look, they look, and they may walk over here and they look. Now, why do they do that? They've already looked. What's this side got to do? I don't need to get to this side of the hole. What's this side got to do with anything? Because more times than not, if I take the time to walk around here, I can see something from this side that I couldn't see from that side. I can't tell you how many times I've putted a ball and watched it, and I thought I was putting right to the hole, and it ends up two feet off, and I say, what happened? And then I make the long walk around, and I say, oh my gosh, I didn't see that. It has a downhill slope. I couldn't see it from that side. I get over here, I can see it fine. If I would have taken the time to make it to the other side and look at it before I putted it, I would have had a lot better chance of making the putt. That's what separates good golfers from the rest of us. Just a subtle little break, a little downhill turn. That's how they win at golf. And that church is how we win at relationships and resolving conflict. Are you willing to even look at the situation from the other person's point of view? Or are you just bent on being right and proving your point? Paul said we should live at peace with everyone if possible. That tells me one thing, it's not possible to always live at peace with some people. Now that's just the truth. But here's what I've found. Listen to this very closely. If you can't be at peace in a situation, you can still be at peace about a situation. Some people I've learned that the only way you can love them is love them from a distance. They're just impossible to love them up close because when you do, they do something that just you know, sets you off again. But you can be at peace in, about a situation even if you're not at peace in a situation. You may just realize how this person is. When you back up, you, say, you, you, you watch them and you say, you know what, this isn't about me. They would have said that to anybody. They would have done this to anybody. This isn't a personal attack on me. Little did I know, they're just a jerk. And you know what, when I realize they're just a jerk, I'm okay with that. I can have peace about the situation even if I'm not at peace in the situation. Even if I don't like it, I realize this is not about me. This is not a conflict with me. This is an issue they're dealing with in their life. Now Paul writes, 
Again, do all that you can do to live at peace with everyone. Do all that you can do. King James says, as much as lies in you. Another translation said, as much as depends upon you. This is where I get to the very quirks of what I want to say, because I'm fixing to get in some of your business, because I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Don't answer out loud. I want you to, first of all, think about that person or people you're in conflict with. That didn't take long, did it? Some of you have been thinking about that since you got here, since I started the message, at least. Doesn't take long. You know exactly who you seem to stay in protracted conflict with. Okay. Ask yourself and answer yourself honestly, because Solomon said if we deceive our own selves, we're fools. So ask yourself this. Have I, not them, have I done all that I can do to make peace with that person? Have I done everything possible, everything that depends upon me? Is there one more thing I could try to make peace with that person? That's what Paul said. Do everything you can do. Let's get honest. Do most of us do everything we can do? Just try to see things from their side, from their point of view. What's really more important to me, hitting the mark or keeping my pride? Which one is really the most important? One God loves, the other God hates. How are you handling your conflict? Let me ask you, do you know who made the longest walk around the mark? You know, do you know who? God did. Think about this. God in heaven says, you know what? I want to see this thing from their point of view. I want to feel what they feel. I want to feel temptation like they feel temptation. And so, God himself, the scripture says, became flesh and dwelt among us. He made the long walk from heaven to earth, came in as a baby, grew up. The Bible said he was tempted in all points like you and I. He was tempted with lust. He was tempted with pride. He was tempted with, with greed. He was tempted with anger. He was tempted in every temptation you've had. He was tempted. He went through the same thing. He became flesh and blood for us. He who knew no sin became sin for us just so God could see it from our point of view. And now Jesus ascends back into heaven and the Bible said he's seated at the Father's right hand. And if you read your Old Testament, you know that God can get angry, right? He can wipe out nations. In the Old Testament, there were times the earth would open up and suck whole cities in because God's anger burned against them. But guess what we have in heaven now? We have God who became flesh and felt our temptation and knows our weakness, who felt all of our hurt and pain. And when, when the wrath of God could easily blow up, Jesus says, hey, hey, but Father, listen, I know what they're going through. I felt that pain. I remember, I remember that temptation. That's not easy. And, and remember, I paid the price for it. I died for it. I became their sacrifice. The Bible said he's our advocate. He's our attorney with the Father. And, and don't get me wrong, the Father's not some cruel judge, but God is just. God is just and God demands righteousness. God demands that sin be paid for. So when God may would say, you know, I'll just open up the earth and kill them all. So when Noah, I'll send the flood and kill them all. And Jesus says, I, remember, I already paid that price. He took the longest walk around of anybody. Anytime. Have you done everything to, remain, to, 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 to get at peace or to solve this conflict with anybody around you? Have you made the long walk around the green and at least looked at it from the other person's point of view? I was in college, and I've told some of you this before, but when I was in college, one of my professors went around the room and got our opinion on highly controversial subjects, things like the death penalty, uh, things like abortion, things, like, things, that, things that are debated, and so got our opinion. And then she goes back around the room and says, okay, she comes to me, she says, Thursday, you're gonna give, you're gonna debate, you're gonna do a debate on abortion. 
and you're going to tell me why abortion should be legal in this country. <laughs> Don't you think I am? She said, oh, you will, and you better convince me because your grade depends on it. Hardest thing I ever did in college. Best thing I ever did in college. Because I had to go home and for the first time in my life, crawl down off my soapbox, and I had to make the long walk around to the pro-choice side and look at the issue from their side, their point of view. Did it change my mind about abortion? No, but it sure did open my eyes to some things. It sure did make me understand where, when I just said, they're just crazy, they're just they're just heathen, they're just, I don't, how can anybody, you know, what, I don't understand, how, you're murdering babies, how, but it forced me. One more quick story and I'll close. Two men came one time from a, a, an organization we're involved with called Mission Mississippi. And, and they're all about tearing down racial walls and building racial reconciliation, particularly between African-Americans and whites, but also in other minorities and bringing that, and it, it revolves around asking each other the hard questions. Those questions that you always want to know, but you're afraid to ask. Now, I've got people that I, I, I ask. I mean, I use Lamar all the time. I ask him the other day, why is black folks always barbecue in the front yard? White folks do it in the backyard. <laughs> and he explained it to me, and I said, I get it now. They barbecue better for one reason. They're proud of their barbecue. But it, that's what Mr. Mississippi's all about, asking the hard questions. Said, I want to understand this. I want to understand. And it helps us because it breaks that tension of always against the other and this, this, that, and the other. And anyway, these two men came and, and they, they told the story of they were out and, and they were, people was protesting an abortion clinic. And this white pastor, he asked this, this he said, you know, and, and I know that your congregation is largely democratic and traditionally democratics are, are pro-choice. And he said, how, do, how is a person a Christ follower and still pro-choice? How can they not be pro-life? How can you follow that? I need to understand that because I'm pro. And this, this black pastor said to him, he said, I'm pro-life also. I believe in the sanctity of, of, of birth, and I believe that birth starts at conception, and I'm, I'm very much pro-life. He said, but if I were to ask the people in my church that question you just asked me, here's what their response would be. He would say, all these people protesting and all of these people who call themselves pro-life, they're not pro-life. They're pro-birth. They're pro-birth. They care about making sure that baby's not aborted. Once that child enters this world and leaves that womb, they could not care less what happens to that child after that. And I sat there and listened to that and I thought, oh my God, am I pro-life or am I just pro-birth? Making the long walk around to the other side. And that's it except far back to James, the writer James, the brother of Jesus, said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Because he said, if you're a hearer only, you're like a man that looks in the mirror and sees dirt on his face. Says, yep, that's me. My pride, my being right, that's what's been important to me, not resolving the conflict. I haven't done everything I could do. I'm not gonna say I'm sorry. If they want, if they want peace, they can say they're sorry. I see that. And then I walk away. James said, if you walk away, you soon forget that you had dirt on your face. You think, I'm right. I'm right. But he said, if you are a doer of the word, it's like looking in a mirror and you see that and you take time to wash that and say, I'm gonna do something about this. I will not live the rest of my life in conflict with this person if at all possible, not as long as it's up to me. I will do everything I can do to make peace with this person. And when I make peace with this person, I make peace with God and I make peace with myself. Because when I'm in conflict with the other person, sometimes the other person doesn't even know. And if they do know, they don't care. So we get in conflict with ourselves. Amen. Again, we're so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message encouraged you in any way, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org and let us know about it. Those type of messages encourage us as we work throughout the week. 
While you're there, check out our latest podcast or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a blessed week.